Good morning, everybody, and uh, welcome to uh, this week's uh, micro seminar. Um, as always, we, we, we hope that everybody's hanging in there. Um, for those of you that are dealing with this tragedy in a very personal way, um, our, our, our best thoughts uh, go out to you and your, and your families. Hopefully we can provide a little bit more respite this week with, with a fascinating talk um, in, in science mode. Um, it's my pleasure to introduce to you uh, uh, Gary Tribble um, from the uh, Lawrence Livermore National Lab. Gary was kind enough to provide me a, a detailed bio so I, I don't have to stumble through his introduction today. Uh, he did his undergrad at the University of Arizona, and then he did a master's at the Desert Research Institute with Allison Murray, where he became fascinated in viruses after reading Maya Breitbart's 2012 Truth or Dare paper, which you'll, you'll be referencing later. So Maya, if you're watching, a uh, big shout out to you. Gary is a soil viral ecologist now. Uh, he received his PhD from The Ohio State University in 2018 under uh, Drs. Virginia Rich and Matt Sullivan. For his dissertation work, he optimized protocols to resuspend viruses from peatland soils in Arctic Sweden and characterize them via metagenomics and viromics. During his final year of grad school, he was awarded a DOE SCGSR fellowship to work at the JGI with Dr. Simon Rue and Emily Alo Fadrush, where he characterized thousands of no novel viral populations and identified their roles in ecosystem carbon cycling. He started as a postdoc at LLNL in December 2018, working with Dr. Steve Blazewitz and Jennifer Petridge, where he now uses stable isotope probing metagenomics to label active microbes and their viruses and soil ecosystems. So we are really excited to have Gary's talk today, contributing another excellent uh, uh, piece to our growing collection of virology uh, seminars. Uh, if you have questions or comments, please leave those in the uh, in the comment section on YouTube Live, and we'll uh, uh, pass those questions on to Gary uh, later on as we get going. So without any further ado, I'm going to turn it back over to Gary here and uh, let him wow us. <laughs> Thank you, Cameron. Um, let's get this figured out. All right, can you see that all right? Yes. Let me see if I can remove this top label here. Here we go. Great, okay, so yeah, I'm gonna be talking about two cool stories I've been working on during my postdoc that we're finishing up here and we're using stable isotopes to really track microbes and their viruses in two extremely different soils. Um, I have a list of co-authors here that were super helpful with this work. So I really appreciate all the support I've had on this project. And if you've been following me over the last year, it'll be a nice idea. You can see how the story has evolved. I also want to thank uh, ISMI and the micro seminar for giving me a chance to present this work. Let's see if I can do this. Um, there we go. Okay. So I want to just highlight some previous talks. There are many good talks. So I encourage people to go through and look at those and start viewing them. I spent so much time just viewing other talks that I was like, no, I need to finish my talk. There's a real, lot of really good soil and virus talks as well, but I want to highlight two that are going to be important for today. So um, on April 21st, um, Flora Vincent was also talking about viruses from the Tara Oceans Consortium. So she was looking at virus activity via RNA and Vero fish, Vero cell fish. Also about a year ago, we had Marine Berg, which is also characterizing virus activity via temporal sampling and also targeted metagenomics. So these are also two other great ways to look at virus activity. And I encourage you to go and look at these talks. So, there's never gonna be a talk that encompasses everything about viruses. And if you see each of our virus talks, we talk about things a little bit differently. I just wanna set the stage so we're all on the same page here. So when we're talking about a virus, we're not talking about bacteria or fungi, right? I know this is a micro seminar, but if you don't work with viruses, this can elude you. So they're basically protein mutatious capsids with nucleic acid inside. And this is what we call the virion. So there's no cell membrane, there's no nucleus and no metabolic function when they're on their own. Now, whether they're alive or whether they're dead, this is arguing semantics. Um, really, I think the best description is when a virus is infected cell, it controls its host metabolism. So it becomes the virus. So at this stage, the virus is living. 
That's what I will argue. I think it's notable to point out that viruses infect all three, all three domains of life. So they're active in evolution and active in life. Viruses come in all shapes and sizes. Their capsids can be about 0.02 microns to two micrometers. Their genomes can be about 2 kb to 2 mb. They have all different types of nucleic acid. We can have DNA viruses that can be double-stranded. An example would be herpes for an enveloped one. What I'm gonna talk about today are bacteriophage, which are unenveloped, also known as naked viruses. We also have single-stranded DNA viruses. And something that's also special about viruses is we have this whole slew of RNA viruses, and they can either be single or double-stranded. Some quick examples is the most famous one currently, which is our SARS-CoV-2 single-stranded RNA virus. It's positive sense. Everyone's gonna know this forever. Um, and then another example would be our Ebola, which is a negative sense RNA virus. But then just focusing on bacteriophage today, and even though some of my viruses may just not be viruses that infect bacteria, these are the most well-studied viruses in different environments. And that's likely what I have here. And a lot of data suggests that this is what I have here. So again, bacteriophage are viruses that infect only bacteria. So before I talk to you about viruses and soils, we need to step back and think about where viruses have been well, well characterized. And this is in the oceans. Some of the first viromics work was done in the ocean and viruses have been characterized very well in the ocean. Back in the 90s, this um, epifluorescence picture went live. And this just showed how there's so many viruses in water. And this really excited people to look into water and say, what are these viruses doing? If there's so many, they have to be doing something. So let's talk about what we've learned about viruses in the ocean. And I wanna point out what they've done specifically for carbon cycling, because that's near and dear to me. Now this is a, I'm gonna show you some comics from the paper that inspired me to look at viruses, in which it shows that there's three iconic roles that viruses have in controlling carbon cycling in the ocean. The first is as the Grim Reaper, and this is where they lice one third of all host cells per day. And this releases about 10 billion tons of carbon per day. This is a huge feast. Here are two different TEM micrographs from a colleague of mine, Dr. Jennifer Brum. On the left side, you have a bacterium with virus progeny being produced within it. After a while, there's enough progeny produced that it causes the cell to explode. Now you can imagine all this delicious, juicy necromass is now available. Now the fate of this, it can either go to feeding other microbes and be respired, or what's recently been seen is that the viruses can actually stick to these, this juicy organic matter and can form aggregates. And it's been shown that viruses are the best predictor of carbon export to the deep ocean. Their second iconic role is as drug dealers. And this is also known as transduction, where viruses mediate horizontal gene transfer. And it's thought that they move about 10 to 29 genes per day. Now this can happen via three different ways. Um, the first one would be via lytic infection. And this is where a virus infects a host and just wants to produce more viruses. So it starts to replicate. The other two forms come from temporary viruses that can do lytic and lysogenic infection. And this is where they can integrate their genome into either the host genome or its plasmid. Now they can just produce more viruses or they can lie low and replicate in the host and then infect and replicate later on. Each of these methods takes different parts randomly of the host genome. The final and third iconic view is as viruses as wizards. And this is where they can regulate their host metabolism. When they infect them, they shut down their metabolism and redirect it for their selfish needs of making more viruses. What's also notable is that they can, they can carry these auxiliary metabolic genes. And these genes typically represent bottlenecks and pathways in which a virus carries a host gene that it got previously, and it, it uses the host metabolism to express this gene. Now, this could be genetic novelty that's introduced, but it's more likely that this gene is something the host already has and just a more efficient version. So in this example on the right, 
I have a microbe and a virus is infected in the microbe. And the virus wants to make more viruses. Now this can be hard because you can imagine either the host is not happy or it's in a harsh environment. So to make more viruses, you need energy and building blocks. And the host may not be able to have this. So a virus can express its auxiliary methodology to overcome this bottleneck and allow it to continuously infect this host and make more progeny. Now let's step back away from the ocean and I wanna talk about AMGs that are near and dear to me. So I work in soils and in 2018, I published a paper talking about some AMGs, these glycoside hydrolases and some other AMGs to break down organic matter. Now another study was also published by Dr. Joanne Emerson on the same topic. So here we have these polysaccharides, which are these complex carbohydrates that exist in soils, especially in the peatlands that we were studying. They can accumulate. Now to a typical microbe, when they see this, they want nothing to do with this. This does not look appetizing. This would be as if you were gonna eat a pineapple with all the rind on it. This is not good and only a few microbes would do this and you would have to be starving to want to do this. Now the virus can, carry these auxiliary metabolites, these glycoside hydrolases, and, and um, express it within the host, breaking these complex carbohydrates down into these juicy monomers. Now these juicy monomers have many different mechanisms or many different ways in which they can determine the fate of carbon. So here we have shown that viruses can overcome this bottleneck and make more viruses. But if you look at the downstream effects, these monomers can actually feed an array of metabolisms because these are juicy. These are cheeseburgers or these are salads if you're a vegetarian, a really good salad. So we saw that all of this available juicy material is feeding these other metabolisms, specifically hydronotrophic and acetoclastic methanogenesis, which produces methane, which is a potent greenhouse gas. So you can think of the virus as infecting the host, stopping its metabolism, but also when it's releasing the nutrients, where are these nutrients going? So why did I have to talk about the oceans? And why didn't I just get right in talking about soils? It's because soils are super complex, not to say that the oceans are not. I love the oceans for all you marine people. But in this two centimeter squared diagram here, you can see there's a lot going on. We have our plants, we have our mites, we have our nematodes, and we have our amoeba. We can zoom in even further, and now we can see our bacteria. We can zoom in more on our bacteria, and we can see their predators, these viruses. Now, when we take a metagenome, or when you do omic study, which is what I do, we're taking a soil sample, and we're extracting all of the DNA from the sample. So when we're taking all of the DNA from the sample, you can imagine that we're taking DNA from all of these different organisms. So when we reconstruct the metagenome, typically less than 2% of our assembled reads go to virus context. So when we look at set soil metagenomes, the viral sequences are swamped by these larger genomes, providing very low resolution on our viruses. So another problem we have in soils is that microbes can exist in many different states and a majority of them are actually inactive at any specific time. You can have your active microbes which are growing, arguably if it's in a harsh environment or if they just want to, they can lie dormant. You can also have these deceased microbes and their nucleic acid languish as relic or ancient DNA. So the goal of my postdoc work was to increase resolution of viruses and be able to target the active microbes and viruses in these systems to understand what is going on. So I do this using stable isotopes. Now just a quick background on stable isotopes. What you need to know is that we can use them as trackers. And the example I'm gonna talk about, one of them is gonna be water. So typically water is H260 now, two hydrogens, one oxygen, eight protons, eight neutrons. The example here is our Tootsie Roll. We can also have enriched water, which is our H218 O, also known as heavy water two hydrogens, one oxygen, except for now we have two extra neutrons on our oxygen. This creates more mass in the same volume area and makes it dense. This would be like other flavored Tootsie Rolls. So to characterize viruses, we use SIP metagenomics. 
And then the first experiment I'm going to talk about, we use natural abundance and enriched water and we incubate it with soil. And what this is going to show us is everything that is active. So anything that's living and active in the soil will be labeled with this enriched water. So this can be all the microorganisms and then the virus is infecting these microorganisms. Now for our second experiment, I'm going to be looking at specifics. And we're going to be using plant biomass and enriched plant biomass, where it has 13C CO2 that's fed to the plant as it's growing. Now, this is not going to label all the active organisms. This is going to label the active organisms that are breaking down and eating this plant biomass so we can target these specific individuals and the viruses that are infecting these individuals. We can extract the DNA. We can do ultracentrifugation. And we can actually separate based on the new density from the isotope, the new growth versus the dormant and deceased growth, or the dormant and deceased microbes. Now, instead of throwing out some of that data, we actually sequence both independently, and we can do comparative bioinformatics to really see what's going on and compare what are we seeing now? We're getting increased resolution. What did we see before? How is our community, how is our lens different now? So for the first experiment, we're going to be going to a partially thawed permafrost bog in Alaska, where we're going to use our enriched oxygen. So this is Bonanza Creek in Alaska. It's in a zone of discontinuous permafrost. Permafrost is ground that's frozen for two or more consecutive years. And it seasonally thaws, and we can sample it while it seasonally thaws, the active layer that's above it. And we can see what's going on. Now this is important because when we're looking at respiration rates and carbon cycling in northern latitudes, a lot of the studies are done during the summer. But over the winter, we think maybe nothing's going on. What is maybe it's negligible because the temperature is just so cold. So we wanted to use stable isotopes to track in a winter conditions if microbes and viruses would be active. So here's some pictures of the field site. You can see that the soil is completely different than soil you're typically used to. Well, depending on where you're from. So this is the peatland soil, where when you actually pick it up and you look at it, it doesn't really look like soil. It looks like a lot of plant biomass that has accumulated. We take a soil core and we took from the top 10 centimeters and we incubate it anoxic with nitrogen gas headspace at negative 1.5 centigrade. And we did a control and then we also did an enriched water. We incubated this for half a year and for a full year, and we reconstructed 23 metagenomes. From these 23 metagenomes, we were able to get about 52,000 contigs. The first thing we did was to look into the microbes, but this is a different story. So we were able to bin 153 medium to high quality mags, and these are metagenome assembled genomes, also known as microbial populations. We did the same thing for our viruses. We used two different virus detectors, Veer Sorter and Deep Veer Finder, and we got about 2,000 robust virus contigs. We clustered these into 332 viral populations. The first thing we wanted to do was to look at their genes and see what they could possibly do. So we used a newer pipeline called Multifate, and we saw that 61% of our genes were brand new. And this is not atypical. Like when you do a virus study, if you're someone that studied viruses, you're like, yeah, that's, that's the norm. There's, there's a lot of unknown and new genes, especially in soils where we haven't sampled a lot of viruses or their genes. Now we wanted to place these viruses in context of other viruses globally. So we used a new gene sharing network called vContact2, and we we're able to compare our viral populations to viral populations from the RefSeq database. And we saw that we had 35 viral population, or sorry, viral clusters. And these represent about genus level taxonomic affiliation. And we saw that 57% of them were novel. So we've got some new viruses here. Now going back to our host, we had 153 microbial populations, but only 32 were considered active. But let's think about that. I just told you we found 32 active microbes in, in sub-zero temperature soil. So microbes are active in below freezing temperatures. Now these 32 active microbes represent seven different phyla of bacteria 
which is why I think these viruses are bacteriophage. And then a majority of these bacteria are actually fermenters. We're able to link out 20% of our viral populations to these mags, and we did this via two different ways. Now, this is not exhaustive. There are actually other ways you can look at virus host linkages, but the two main ones that I like are nucleotide similarity and CRISPRs, which are clusters of regularly interspaced short palindromic repeats. Now, for similarity, we actually look for viral DNA that's being flanked by host DNA. And then for our CRISPRs, this is an acquired immunity that the host gets from, infect from a previous infection from the virus incorporates some of the viral DNA. So in this typical CRISPR array, you can have your spacers and you can have your repeats flanking viral DNA. And this helps us identify and link viruses to their host. So now let's compare the inactive versus the active viruses. This is the heat map. On the x-axis, we have our 332 viral populations. And on our y-axis, I have the 23 metagenomes grouped into our four categories. And in blue, we have our natural abundance water, either at a half a year or a full year. And in red, I have our enriched water um, samples at a half a year or a full year. So what the colors represent represent are the normalized relative abundance of these viral populations with white meaning they're not abundant or not present, um, blue meaning low abundance and dark colors representing higher abundance. The first thing you should notice is that 21% of a viral community is present in all of our treatments, whether it be active or inactive. So we know that there's active viruses because we detect them in the active treatments. Now, while they're also in the inactive at the same time, we could guess that maybe this is from the presence of relic DNA or ancient DNA. This could also be bank viruses, which are viruses, especially the variants where maybe the host is not around, so the virus is just hanging out and therefore it's not active. Or maybe something happened to its captive or internally where it's not able to infect it. So another way to look at this community is if we plot the 23 metagenomes on a PCOA plot, which is an ordination plot. What we did here is we compared them using Ray Curtis dissimilarity. So the closer stuff these items are to each other, the more similar they are, the further they are apart, the more dissimilar they are. So in light blue, we have our natural abundance samples and in dark blue, we have our enriched samples. The circles represent a half year and the squares represent a whole year. The first thing you should immediately notice is that we have a separation between our natural abundance and our enriched samples. So imagine taking a metagenome from your soil or from your environment. When you're looking at the active versus just the whole bulk metagenome, you're seeing a different community here. So we're getting our resolution on the ones we care about. Now, if we zoom in even more and we group them now by their treatment, so in light blue again, natural abundance, and dark blue, we have our enriched samples. You can see in the top left that we see no change from a half year to a full year when we're just taking a bulk of the genome. But when we're looking at the SIP fractions and we're looking at the enriched samples, we can see from a half year to a full year, there is a change in the viral community. So this is a dynamic community. And we can only see this because of the method we did. If we had just taken a regular bulk soil metagenome, we would have missed this. Now going back, I wanna emphasize, you may have already thought this yourself because I've said it, we have active viruses. So there's not only active microbes, but active viruses in sub-zero temperatures. So this is crazy, mind blowing. I thought this was pretty cool. So let's just focus on just these active treatments. So again here, we have 243 viral populations that persisted. This is a large amount of our community that is persisting. Before we talked about only 23 of our mags, of our microbial populations of the 153 are active, but for our viruses, we have 243 of our 332. You'll see that from a half year to a full year, many of our viral populations are persisting. We have 71% that actually increase their abundance over time. Now this can be for many different reasons. A couple that I'll point out is they could be tempered viruses propagating the microbial host, so they're actually not in the environment. 
this could be virions persisting in the environment. So maybe they infected the host and they're just accumulating in the environment. It can also be from accumulation of their DNA. So maybe their capsid um, exploded and they're surviving as relic, possibly relic or ancient DNA. If you look to the left, you'll also see that we have eight viral populations that are there at a half a year, but they're not there later that year. So this could be maybe from grazing of viruses. This could be that their host acquired immunity like CRISPRs, so therefore they are no longer able to infect their host. Or it could be something else. We have to look more into this. You'll also see in the middle here that we have 151 viral populations that weren't there at a half year, but they were there at the full year. So this community is changing. Okay. So we just talked about our Pashtathod permafrost habitat. Now let's move into our highly dynamic tropical rainforest. So this is the Lakeo Experimental Forest in Puerto Rico. This is also in the US. And what describes these soils best is that soils that naturally oscillate between oxic and anoxic conditions. Now, this is the only rainforest in the United States and it's located in the northeastern part of Puerto Rico. So the experiment was set up a little bit different here. Again, we were not interested in looking at all the active viruses. We wanted to know in this lush tropical rainforest, who is breaking down and recycling these nutrients? So here we use our natural plant biomass or we use our rich plant biomass. So again, it does not label all active microbes. It labels those that are specifically breaking down this plant biomass. And we incubated this with 20 grams of soil. We had four different treatments. So our first treatment is we kept it oxic the whole time. Our second one, we fluctuated before four days of oxic and four days of anoxic. We then also did eight days of anox or oxic and four days of anoxic. And then we kept it anoxic the whole time. The way we were able to control whether it was oxic or anoxic was using the headspace of air or nitrogen gas. And we incubated it for 44 days. And after these 44 days, we, we um, extracted DNA and reconstructed 85 SIP fractionated metagenomes and then also 10 bulk soil metagenomes. So using these 95 metagenomes, we we're able to assemble over 280,000 or contacts. Looking at the hosts first, the microbes, we have 326 medium to high quality microbial populations. And then doing the same thing for the viruses, we we're able to get about 45,000 robust viruses using our two virus detectors. This is this clustered into 640 viral populations. So we have a lot more viral populations, but we also had a lot more sampling. Looking at annotation of their genomes, we saw that about 65% were just brand new. So again, like before, a lot of new viral genes. Also, the put them in context of other well-known viruses. We found 432 viral clusters, and about 25% of them had no similarity to known viruses. So again, using heat maps to look at our viral populations, Probably going to be sick of heat maps by the end of this, and I'm sorry. On the x axis here, we have our 640 viral populations. On the y axis, I have it grouped by our different treatments and our samples. So in black, we have our bulk soil metagenomes. And in blue, I have our, plant, our natural plant biomass SIP fractions. And in red, I have our enriched plant biomass SIP fractions. And then for the coloration, you should see the white means no abundance. Orange means some abundance, and the green is what you're looking for for very abundant. I want to compare the SIP fraction to the bulk metagenome. So we're going to take out the field sample, which is another control we had to look somewhere off to the side if it's something we can compare it to. Uh, I also want to point out that if you look at each individual row, you'll see two different numbers. The first number is the number of viral populations in that row. And the second number is the number of unique viral populations in that row. So now just zooming in on our SIP versus our bulk samples. This is really important. This makes me excited to look at viruses in the future using SIP fractionated metagenomes. We saw 
more viral populations in our SIP fraction AMF genomes compared to our bulk. So we're getting increased resolution on our viruses. Now let's look at our active ones. Again, not all active ones, just the ones that were infecting microbes that were breaking down the enriched plant biomass. About 27% of our 640, or 640 viral populations were infecting microbes that were actively breaking down these plant nutrients, this plant biomass, sorry. Again, the first thing you should notice is that 33% of our virus, our viral populations are active in all of our treatments. But you should also notice that in the oxic ones, we have 27% more viral populations compared to our anoxic. So this is suggesting that more oxygen, increased diversity, more viral populations. This is interesting. This is similar to some of the stuff we see in the oceans where viruses are correlating with oxygen, sorry. Now we don't wanna leave the oxic samples out yet because if you notice in the bottom left corner, 16% of our active viral populations are present only in the anoxic samples and they are super abundant. So let's just relook at this, but in a different way. If we look at the richness, our oxic samples have the most viral populations. So oxic would be the blue. We have a low frequency in the yellow, high frequency in the red, and our anoxic in green. Now, if we can put this into our diversity, this is Shannon's H diversity. You see our oxic samples are the most diverse and our anoxics are the least diverse. But if we tease this apart and we just look at the eveness, you can see that they're pretty steady for most of our samples, except for the anoxic. So what this means is that we have a couple of these viral populations in this, these anoxic treatments that are highly ab abundant and they're dominant. So maybe this could be specialist. This is something that I have to look into even more. Now, getting back to our hosts, we talked about 326 medium to high quality microbial populations. Now we had a huge diversity, as you can imagine, in these soils, because there's so much nutrients available. We had 20 different phyla of bacteria. Now, when we linked our viruses to our host, 30% of our viral populations did link to them, but it only spans six different phyla. So it looks like a majority of the phyla out there are just not being infected, or at least we didn't detect it. Now we use nucleotide similarity and CRISPRs to link these, but maybe they don't need to infect all of the microbes out there because we are specifically looking at plant biomass degradation. So in this figure, I know it's big, I'll tease it apart for you, just give me a second. We have our 20 different phyla, right? And we're gonna focus on just on one, but I wanted to show you that they're all on the same um, X and Y axis, even though the Y axis does change. So let's look at the top left corner for acidobacteria. So what you're looking at here is each dot is representing a different microbial population within this phylum. On the x-axis, we have our different classes of substrate that these organisms, these microbes, can have a glycosahydrolase to break down. The y-axis is the number of genes they have of that substrate class in its genome. So if the dot's higher, it has more genes of that substrate class, so more, sorry, it has more genes of glycosahydrolases to break down that substrate class. All right, now let's back out again. Okay, so just take a second to look at the y-axis, that they're not all the same. Now we talked about viruses only infecting six of the phyla and not all 20. Now, if we link our viruses or hosts, if we overlay our virus data here, these are the six hosts that our viruses are infecting. So they're infecting key degraders. This is huge. So let's think about what this can mean though. So going back to how viruses can impact and control carbon cycling, specifically microbial carbon cycling. They can lyse the microbial host. So this is a top-down control and they just stop that their metabolic output. They can also release these nutrients to feed other metabolisms. And this is a bottom-up approach. They can also carry these auxiliary metabolic genes. Now I have here a list of auxiliary microbial genes found in these viral populations. Now, what does all this mean for the fate of carbon? Well, if we think of the kill the winner hypothesis, where 
viruses are killing the most abundant microbial population, controlling it, therefore maintaining microbial diversity. These nutrients can be feeding an array of metabolisms now that we have increased diversity. So instead of leaving as CO2, it could be leaving as methane. This, this could be bad, but we're just speculating. It also could be that there is maybe a viral shunt in soils like there is in the oceans. And this is where viruses are killing hosts and keeping the nutrients at that trophic level and preventing it from going up in trophic levels. So this is keeping our carbon in the soil. Finally, a new emerging idea is this idea of entombment, where when a virus is releasing this microbial necromance, in the oceans we see that this can form aggregates and sink. But in soils, it's a different environment. We have structure, right? So you can imagine different pore sizes everywhere. These small, juicy, sticky organic matter can actually get stuck in these small pores that's inaccessible to microbes. So therefore it can just stay and languish and accumulate over time. So the carbon is staying in the soil. Again, these are all avenues I'm gonna investigate further. Okay, I spoke a lot, I'm, more, I'm thirsty, um, there's a lot going on. So let's just summarize everything that I talked about. We applied SIP metagenomic stable isotope probing on two dramatically different soils because we had different stable, we had different isotopes we wanted to test and what they could do looking at the utility of SIP metagenomics. And our first one in our sub-zero Arctic soil, we wanted to see if there's active microbes and viruses. So we added enriched water to label all active organisms. Now in our tropical lush um, rainforest soils, we knew that microbes were active. We knew that there's a high diversity of microbes going on here. Look at all that food. There's a smorgasbord. Of course they're excited. So we wanted to see, now who's actually responsible amongst all these weeds at breaking down this plant biomass? So we could try to look at the fate of this carbon. So I told you with our first experiment, we identified active microbial and viral populations in Zeb zero temperatures. This is awesome. This makes me excited. This makes me want to do more work in the Arctic. I love polar research, and this just says, go for it more now. We also saw that there's temporal succession of our viral population. So therefore, there's a dynamic viral community. We also saw evidence that the viral populations may persist in the environment for up to or even more than a year. We saw that there was a small portion of our microbial populations active, but this large portion of our viral populations active. So what does this actually mean? Are they infecting multiple hosts? What is going on? So we need to look more into this. So then going to a Lurquillo experimental forest in Puerto Rico, completely different soil, right? We saw that viral populations infect key microbial populations involved in the degradation of this plant biomass. We also saw that redox strongly influences our viral population activity and that the SIP fractions can actually recover more of our population than our bulk soil fraction, our bulk soil metagenomes. So let's synthesize both these experiments to see what we can gain from using SIP with our metagenomes. We got a lot of novel viral populations and a lot of novel genes. So this is not new. This always happens with metagenomes. Hopefully over time, we're gonna be collecting enough stamps where we can increase our virus detection, especially in soils, and start seeing, hey, maybe 90% of their genome is annotated with something that we actually know. I don't know how many years that's gonna take. We also saw that SIP can be used to track, track microbes and viruses in soils, and that SIP metagenomics provides increased resolution on our viral populations and communities. Now, I didn't talk about this, but it's noteworthy to bring up that the metabolic repertoire of the microbes that were dormant or deceased versus active was extremely different. So this means that when we're looking and we're taking a metagenome of our habitat and we're going through reconstructing all those metabolisms, a lot of those metabolisms may not actually be happening. Now it's not to say that we shouldn't be looking at that because it gives us a catalog of the potential out there, what happened either in the past or what could happen in the future. But if we're wanting to look at what's actually happening now, we need to assess activity. So with that, there's a lot of people to acknowledge. 
I'm not going to read off everything, but I just want to say I am so thankful to have two great mentors and a lot of other great mentors that I'll all know. Being part of this large SFA group um, with UCB, NAU, and some other people, it, it's been fun working with them. I also want to do a land acknowledgement for both of our field sites and for Lawrence Livermore National Lab to have the privilege to be able to work with these soils and do this kind of research. It's, it's really great. I just want to take one more second to do a plug. Uh, there's the DOE SCGSR Fellowship, which you heard is something I got, and I really liked it, and it really helped my career. So if you're a PhD student, post your qualifying exam. Maybe you aren't now, but in the future, just keep this in mind. You do research in terrestrial ecology. This is specifically for LL now. And let's say you want to add stabilized toprobene, nanosims, microbiology, rhizosphere studies, omics work, or any other resource at LNO. Maybe there's some cool people that you want to work with. There's lots of cool people there. Of course you do. Come work with us. Email Dr. Jennifer Petridge. The deadline for the current call has been extended until Wednesday, May 20th. So with that, I'll take any questions. And thank you so much for listening to me talk. <laughs> Okay, hey, thank you, Gary. That that was that was awesome. Um, we do have a few questions. Um, we've had a we've had an active uh, group of concurrent viewers. Uh, the first is from Paul Carini. Uh, is, is there a way to differentiate between lysogenic phage and active bacteria and active lytic phage? I mean, there there are, there are ways, right? This is this is a huge question. Where we, uh, so. There are many ways, and of course, I don't know everything. So I'm going to tell you, in my mind, what I would do. I would want to culture a virus. So bringing in some soil culturing, you would love this. And we would need to see it infect a host and observe, is it integrating or is it just killing the host? Because again, the tempered viruses can do both lytic and lysogenic replication, where virulent phages can only kill the host. So that's one way to actually determine what it's doing. Bioinformatically looking at the genomes, this is really tough. You could argue and say, hey, there's an integrase gene, so therefore it's a tempered virus. I'm, I'm not so sure we're 100% there yet bioinformatically, so we can speculate, but really this is where culturing comes back into play. Cool, okay. Good plug for cultures. <laughs> All right. <laughs> um, uh, uh, a, co a question from Lin King Chen. Hi, Gary. This is Lin. Oh, I might have mispronounced uh, Lin Jing Chen from uh, UC Berkeley. I think the first host identification method, quote, nucleotide similarity is actually prophage. That, that's exactly right. Sorry, I should have specified more. This would be doing a blast end, and it is prophage. You're absolutely right. Okay. Uh, Roland Hatzenpickler, cool talk. Can you comment on how you could go from this data to how this virus turnover affects carbon and nitrogen cycling in the system? Can you calculate actual viruses made per time unit uh, times carbon atoms per virus on average? Yeah, <laughs> Roland, that is, uh, yep. So currently a lot of our methods are not 100% quantitative, right? We need to be able to look at rates. So different viruses have different birth sizes, and that's the number of progeny they produce. So again, we'd have to bring in a combination of culture and um, metagenomics work, where we have a virus and we culture it. We basically analyze its whole genome. We know what's going on. We can well describe it. What's its birth size? How, how efficient is it at infecting the host? How long does it take? What's its optimal host? Can it infect more than one host? We add that back in the soil and we somehow track that virus. This is something we're thinking about and looking into doing. Um, but it's just really hard at this time to be going into that. But again, as you were saying, it's not 100% quantitative. So this is something that we're working towards. OK. Let's see. I don't see anything on Twitter under the hashtag, so I think we're good. Um, so that's that's all the questions that are in the uh, in the chat right now. But um, let's see. Oh, 
Thanks, Gary. Like your Zoom background so much, could you please share if possible? That's the last, last question. Of course. Uh, I just want you to know, um, I made that two days ago because I was reading a bunch of articles and I was getting irritated where they were describing agricultural soils and they're talking about how important the, the fungi are and the bacteria. And then they talked about protease that are eating the bacteria and how the nutrients are being cycled, but no mention of viruses. So I'm like, oh my gosh. Sweet, okay. Well, so uh, get in touch with Gary if you want his cool background for your Zoom talk, seminar, meeting, whatever it is. <laughs> um, and uh, if you if you come up with questions that, uh, that were not answered this time or you wanna to talk to Gary about this more, obviously get in touch. Gary, thank you so much for your, your contribution today. Um, and uh, good luck with everything in, this, in, the, in the near future. Thank you so much, Cameron. Thank you, everyone.